Okay, everybody, welcome to tonight's share. Tonight is a very special show. We have a lot from Eretz Yisrael, Dr. Jacob Friedman, Dr. Yaakov Friedman. Thank you for coming here, waking up so early morning. Fire tugs, we really appreciate it. Tonight will be our 37th share. Again, I want to thank everybody for posting it. It's all over the place and people are talking about it. Me and Menachem got a tremendous amount of emails this week. Uh, one day we'll share it, Menachem. We have to show some of those uh, amazing things that this platform is helping tremendous people. And Dr. Friedman is here tonight to help more people. So thank you for coming. We appreciate it. Um, tonight's going to be a shorter share because Dr. Friedman has to be off by 11.15. So we're going to try to really, really pile everything in as quick as possible. Is that okay? I okay. am really grateful. I just fear that uh, if I don't get to Davin Nate uh, with my kids, they're going to come and bust down the door. I hear the problem. Okay, that's one of the questions. If my kids want to Davin Nate, what should I do? That's one of the questions. And I want to thank first our advertising sponsors, Lakewood Scoop, uh, for always promoting us here in Lakewood, and Robin Yanif from Chazak, and special thank you to Kyla Kaufman from, and just Shmuel Sam from JCM for promoting us on all the digital platforms. We really appreciate it. Um, next Sunday, we have a, also an amazing share. We're going to be dealing with the master of, da, of tefillah, Rabbi Heshi Kleiman, who's written, I think, like seven, nine, ten, who knows how many books on davening, praying with fire. And we're going to be discussing tefillah and really uh, getting a deeper level of understanding. And uh, all the questions we always had on Tefillah, we're going to be able to ask the person that actually uh, could probably answer most of them. So it should be a very uplifting shear. Tremendous amount of chizik. Um, again, we have the source of having with the world famous, one of the top psychiatrists in Eretz Yisrael, Mishpacha columnist, Dr. Jacob Friedman. Before we start, let's open up with Coach Menachem, our host. Thank you. Welcome, everyone, to another show. And let's get real with Coach Menachem. And... Uh... We are pleased to have you, Dr. Friedman, with us tonight. It's a huge topic. And uh, many people told me they, they read the column, but they've never seen you before. So tonight is their chance <laughs> to ask. Tonight you have a chance to ask your questions, all, all the questions that you've had from the column or any mental health questions. So the topic tonight is, is we're going to focus on mental health and uh, Hope and healing together. So again, it's a huge topic. The emails that we got, a lot of emails and the spectrum is huge. Obviously we will not be able to answer all the questions, but uh, if you, I guess if you wanna ask, you want your question to be asked, uh, make sure it's live. So that's before all the questions that we got in. Um, whether it's, um, how do we know if it's mental illness, or if it's just normal anxiety, panic attack, we'll find out tonight a little bit. Many have uh, gone for help, different places, psychiatrists and uh, therapists and have not really felt that it helped them and have given up. And sometimes could have some suicidal no, thoughts. No, I saw that, I saw that. Um, what, what do they do? The question is also what do, what, what does a significant other, if you're living with somebody with mental health, do we listen to them? Do we try to help them, give them a hand? Or sometimes it could be counterproductive by being there for them and listening, you're giving them the little bit of the hope, but they're, it's holding them back from getting the real help that they need. They, most of the times they need, they need to see a professional, somebody knows how to deal with it. And by helping them, sometimes they can hold them back. Living with mental health, mental illness sometimes can feel like you're constantly driving a, a double tractor trailer in a small city, constantly with that so much energy and it can be very hard. And coming to a platform like ours tonight does not mean that it's gonna take away all your problems and give you all the answers. But what we could we could do over here is get a little bit of insight from a professional, somebody who lives and deals with this day in, day out with uh, all different types of people and uh, has been with many gedolim. Should be able to, to get some ideas, hope, and just listening about the, on this topic to see how others deal with it sometimes could give the strength for people to continue looking for the right answers, even though they have not found it yet. So thank you very much, Dr. Dr. Freeman, for being with us. And I would like to thank the sponsors tonight, Kamfi Fager, for sponsoring tonight our show. And Hashem should help. We should have atzlocha, and everybody should be able to hear what they need to hear. Shkoyach. 
Thank you, Coach yeah, Renato. Appreciate it. Uh, tonight's share was sponsored in part. It was brought by Confer Figa. Put it all together. Really appreciate it. We have famous liquid therapist on uh, with us, uh, Mrs. Blanca. If she's on, can you press star six and unmute yourself? Hi, Blanca, you there? Yeah, hello. You hear Hi, me? How are you? Yeah, 300 okay, good. people listening. No, I didn't hear the question. The I was question unmuted. Is, tell us about Confe Fega. Okay, Confe Fega. I'm very excited to talk about it. It is really an amazing organization, and it's really geared to help Lakewood families. It's based in Lakewood, and it's for families struggling with mental illness. The wonderful selfless volunteers, we call them advocates, they provide emotional, environmental, and practical support for families. The whole goal is to reduce the client's stress and really increase their quality of life. Each uh, client gets a detailed intake when they call in, and they're paired with a advocate that's appropriate for that situation and that family. The advocates are also trained by Confe Fega, and together with the therapist, they help the clients. So it's like a triad. It's a triangle, client, therapist, and advocate. Right now, actually, Confe Fega is looking for volunteers, male and female, because Baruch Hashem, it's growing, and it's a successful organization. I have to say for myself, I'm a therapist in Lakewood, and I cannot tell you how it's changed some of my clients' lives. It is giving them so much strength, so much support, and it makes a huge difference in their lives. So I want to give everyone the number first, because now if, in case someone needs to call in for help or to volunteer, the number is 732-506-2590. And I hope that we're going to inspire many other communities to start this kind of organization. Thank you so much, Blanca. Really appreciate it for that opening. So again, Confe Fega's organization, the number is 732-506-2590, and it was sponsored by Nishmas Dakar Shlema, who was the mother of Fegi, who's Confe is named after a 97-year-old Holocaust survivor who was nifted last week. Okay, thank you. Confe Fega, correct. Okay, thank you, my wife, for correcting me. Um, again, I just want to say one thing about the program. A lot of people come on, they want to know, you know, what they could do to help. And, you know, a lot of times, Baruch Hashem, for the people that are watching and they see what people are going through and Baruch Hashem, they're not going through it. It gives them a lot of chizik. I, I heard this from a few people actually today. So if you're Baruch Hashem, okay, and Hashem is blessing you to have a good, good into life, try to volunteer, call them. They really, really need men and women to volunteer. It's an hour, two hours a week. I really, really make a difference in this world. I was very touched by the organization. They have about 40 people right now doing it. And I know from one of the families that are involved, it's Mamish saved their, saved their mishpacha. I, I wish uh, Mr. Roosevelt could read that letter, but we don't have time for it. But it was an amazing letter. Um, we have another sponsor tonight. Share the screen. Another sponsor to help to, that one. Little, yeah. It's called Grant Max. It's a, it's a friend of mine. He's, the, he's a boutique company that's focusing on helping businesses get the PPP round two. They already closed some transactions. I know a lot of people are waiting. Um, they're, they're personalized and they go through you know, all your documents and they submit it to the banks. If you know anybody that's trying to get the PPP loan now, uh, please have them call or email immediately. The email address is info at grantmax, I-N-F-O at grantmax.net, or call them or text them at 609-300-3928. And now I'm going to read Dr. Friedman's bio, and let's hop right in. Dr. Fr Dr. Jacob Friedman is a board-certified psychiatrist practicing medicine in both the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and the state of Israel, where he maintains private practice in Jerusalem. He's a graduate of the University of Massachusetts Medical School, the Harvard Longwood Psychiatry Residency Program, where he was a chief resident in inpatient psychiatry in the receipt of the Henry G. Altman Award for Excellence in Medical Education. By the way, I got that award also. Dr. Friedman maintains a facility position as an assistant professor of psychiatry at Tufts University School of Medicine. He has received multiple awards for medical education. He has published academic articles and journals, including the American Journal of Psychiatry, the Harvard Review of Psychiatry, the British Journal of Psychiatry. He's presented research at the American Psychi Psychi Psychiatric, Psych Psychiatric Association's annual meeting, given ground rounds at the Harvard Medical School and his re 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 respected speaker on all topics spanning uh, medicine, ethics, and Jewish thought. Dr. Friedman runs a private practice providing psychopharmacology. Did I say that properly? And psychopathic, psych, psychopathic, psychotherapy services as slow well. Slow down, as slow down, slow down. It's okay. I have ADHD. Services as well as for forensic psychiatry consultants. Additionally, Dr. Friedman is an active as an organizational consultant and is proud to serve in both leadership as advisory roles with healthcare and technology companies. Dr. Friedman is the author of the weekly column in the Mishpacha magazine and is recognized as an expert in treatment of mental illness within the Jewish community. Letters of appreciation, haskamas, are available from Abbasha Weishlita. Reb Noach Orlaski Shlita, Reb Yitzhak Berkowitz Shlita, as well as Reb Yahu Maimon Shlita of the Israeli Rabbanut. 
Dr. Yaakov Friedman, the floor is yours. I'm tremendously honored to be here, Reb Usher. There's a 0% chance I'm going to speak 4% uh, as fast as you did. Uh, I just couldn't make it happen. Um, I'm very grateful, uh, though, to be here because there's so many people out there who really care about Klal Yisrael and Coach Menachem, uh, Reb Usher, and frankly, anybody on this call, especially my cousin Nosen, uh, really care about Klal Yisrael. So it's fantastic to be here with the two of you. Uh, in general, I try to wake up at three in the morning to start studying Kabbalah. Uh, so it wasn't a big deal to take a quick break from that to talk about mental health. And the truth is we have to talk about mental health because uh, you can't have a solution unless you have a problem and you don't have a problem unless you're talking about it. So here we are talking about mental health, talking about how we can support our community. And the truth is just about everybody knows somebody who has a challenge with mental illness. How do I know that? Because one in three people have a challenge with mental health. And that's something we know based on large epidemiological studies. So that means that if you know more than two people, that you know somebody who is struggling with a mental health challenge at some point. I remember one time uh, I decided to bring my children to go see the Admor. And it was Erev Erev Pesach, so it was a great idea to get out of the house. Otherwise, I'd have to do a lot of scrubbing and cleaning. So I grabbed my sons, we got dressed up in our suits, and we drove into Shalayim. We got a bagel. We went to go see the Admor. There was a lot of pushing and shoving in order to get in. It was one of those Admors, uh, but we didn't get trampled. It was not like a Brazilian soccer match. And by the time that we were able to get ourselves to the front of the line and enter into the room, the Admor was sitting there and he gave my sons a bracha for their Torah learning, he gave me a bracha. And I said to him, Kavoda Rov Shlita, if I can be helpful in any way, I'm happy to do so. And he said, uh, well, I appreciate uh, the offer, Dr. Friedman. And I said, obviously it's Bidyevit. And the Rav told me, uh, it's not Bidyevid. When I was a kid, mental illness was Bidyevid, but now it's Lachila. Everybody has something. And that's really the truth. Uh, I remember about a year ago, I went out to speak in a large European community where there had been a number of suicides uh, in the young men and women. And we were talking about mental health with the uh, hollow of the community. And uh, they asked, how many people here are struggling with a mental health issue? I said, well, uh, if you have 10,000 families in your city, that means that you'll have about 1,000 women who will deal with postpartum depression at some point. That means that you have uh, easily hundreds of people struggling with bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. That means that you have thousands of children who will deal with substance use at some point in their lives. That means that you will have well over a thousand husbands who are dealing with anxiety disorders, with OCD. These are striking numbers. You know, we talk about everybody knows somebody with diabetes, everybody knows somebody with epilepsy. Everybody knows a ton of people with anxiety, depression, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, OCD, serious mental illnesses. And with that in mind, we have a lot of work to do because there's so many great organizations out there to help families that are going through cancer, that are going through financial crisis. But there's a tremendous gap when it comes to dealing with uh, mental health issues due to the stigma. And frankly, that's why I'm very excited to be here tonight and to also uh, give a talk uh, on behalf of Kante Fega, which is an amazing organization that's fighting the stigma of mental health and Mamish sending volunteers into the houses of families that are experiencing mental health crises to help the families get organized, to help the families make sure there's food on the table, to help make sure that the kids are ready for school. 
this is a uh, really Heliga Voda. So big Yasher Koach to the team at Tanfei Vega. And of course, uh, Coach Menachem, uh, Yasher Koach for all the amazing work you're doing uh, to follow on the heels of such great people as uh, Rev. Y.Y. Jacobson and to follow up my colleague, uh, Rev. Svi Gluck. That is uh, fantastic stuff you're doing. So I'm really happy to be here and I'll start talking infinitely faster now, even though it's against my nature for the sake of answering some of these important questions. Okay, amazing. So we're going to take, uh, take a quick poll. And um, oh. one second, one second. Okay, we're going to take a quick poll now just to take a break it up. And then what we're going to do is we're going to get some live, we have actually some live questions already. And we'll start with that. And then we'll do some other questions that we have. And uh, let's try to cover as much ground to get it ready tonight. Dr. Freeman has to be off at 11 15. So let's have a run. Lunch of, lunch of questions. Everybody on, again, it's anonymous. Just let's, let's get the feeling of everybody. What were the results of you or someone you know struggling with mental illness after going for help? Four answers. Positive, got out, got out of the problem. Positive, still working on it. Number option three, negative, have not seen substantial results. Option D, negative, nothing worked. That's the first option. First question, anybody can click on any of those answers. Second question is, do, do you think it, do you think if you or your loved one might be suffering some kind of mental illness, what would be the first thing to do? A, speak to a Rav. B, speak to a basic standard therapist. I meant to write like, you know, simple therapist. Wait a little bit to see if it resolves itself. Or option D, discuss with your family. And Dr. Friedman, this is for you. Do you read Dr. Jacob Friedman's column in the Mishpacha magazine? Yes, all the time, and I love it. No, never knew about it. Sometimes if I have time. So again, three questions. What were the results of you or someone you know struggling with mental illness after going for help? Positive, got out of the problems, still working on it. Negative, I haven't seen substantial results. Negative, nothing worked. Do you think if you or someone you, someone you love might be going, suffering from some type of mental illness, what would be the first thing to do? Speak to Rov, speak to basic therapist, wait a little bit to see if it resolves itself, we'll discuss with family members. The final question is for Dr. Freeman. So give it five seconds, then we'll start with a live question, right? Freeman's five so, I could just uh, comment quickly on what I'm seeing uh, in the survey. Well, no, nobody sees the results yet, so let me share it and then we'll comment, okay? Forgive me, forgive okay, me. Let's forgive end me. the poll. Okay, now share it with everybody. Now everybody can see. Now, Dr. Friedman, it's yours. Yeah, so uh, I, I think that uh, number one is really not a surprise. Uh, the vast majority of people, almost three quarters of people feel like it was helpful to go for treatment. I think that uh, there is about a quarter of folks who felt it was not so helpful. So Baruch Hashem, there are a lot of great resources out there for uh, the From Belt as far as getting the help that people need. And when people are engaged in mental health treatment, Baruch Hashem, we've come a long way from back in the day when they used to uh, shock people with electric eels 2000 years ago in Central Europe. Um, you know, for folks that uh, haven't had a good experience, uh, again, I would encourage people to turn to uh, Relief, to turn to Amudim uh, here in Eretz role. Also, there are a lot of great organizations that do referrals uh, and try and match people up with a high quality provider. I think that a lot of times people uh, end up going uh, to acupuncturists or to homeopathic providers or other Narishkeit uh, for uh, mental health challenges and sometimes that doesn't work so well. Um, as far as uh, question number two, um, speaking to a therapist is fantastic. You know, that's the certainly the address. Uh, when folks have a uh, cardiac problem, they should see a cardiologist. When folks have a pulmonary problem, they should see a pulmonologist. When folks have a rheumatological problem, they should see a rheumatologist. When folks have a uh, psychiatric problem, uh, they should certainly not go to see a reflexologist as their uh, first uh, person that they're running into. Uh, that being said, it's always good to see a supportive rub. There's so many great rabbanim that are uh, out there to support uh, the community. Um, I think also, you know, reaching out to family members is a very important thing. Uh, I always uh, look forward to schmoozing with my parents if I have challenges. And I always tell my kids that uh, I might not know everything, but I've been around on the planet for slightly longer than you have. So I'm happy to uh, answer any questions that you might have. Um, and I think that's a, a great thing. 
um, in general, the idea of waiting to see if a mental illness resolves itself, uh, I think that a lot of things do resolve themselves. Uh, things like being homesick at summer camp, uh, things like uh, a bit of the baby blues after a child, but for real problems like depression in a Bakra yeshiva, uh, if there's a question that maybe he's homesick, um, that's not going to resolve itself. It's going to get worse with time. Uh, when baby blues is really postpartum depression, that's when it gets worse uh, as we continue with time. So that's kind of a simon that uh, things might be uh, a problem with mental illness as opposed to just a, a natural response to stress. Dr. Freeman, Dr. Freeman, let's get to some of the questions, okay? Because I have a lot for, of- for, Forgive me. Okay, no uh, as far Freeman, as the, the column- main, The main I, question was, how many people- read I, I don't read my column. Um, uh, in general, I read Jonas and Rosenblum. He's a genius. Uh, if we ever needed somebody to debate versus uh, the Goyim like the Ramban used to do, uh, I would definitely send him. So that's the column I would recommend reading. Okay, let's start off with the first question, uh, Dr. Freeman, the most basic one. Again, you can X the, 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 the results. First question over here, um, that's a general question. How does a psychiatrist diagnose mental illness? Sure. Um, I generally tell my patients that I'm bald. And if you can see, I got a bunch of gray hair here now. So I've been doing this for a little while um, and it's pretty much all I do. Uh, and that's why it's so important to go to a professional uh, who does this all day long. I, I will agree that uh, psychiatry is quite a gray science. Um, we don't have x-rays. Uh, we don't have blood tests. In fact, uh, sometimes we do order x-rays, uh, sometimes we order brain scans, sometimes we order blood tests, but most of the time that's to rule out uh, other medical problems that could be mimicking a psychiatric diagnosis. So, for example, uh, anybody who shows up with depressive symptoms should have their thyroid tested because oftentimes uh, that hormonal problem can mimic uh, mental health issues. So uh, how do we make a diagnosis? Uh, Again, it's not as scientific, I think, as we wish, but we will ask a lot of questions uh, to the patients that we're sitting with, uh, questions about uh, how they grew up, questions about what they're experiencing. And I think, uh, most importantly, we'll also go for collateral information, meaning uh, I'm only as good as the information that I have, and sometimes a patient will come in and will I overemphasize their symptoms and make it seem as though it's a lot worse uh, for some reason, or they will minimize their symptoms and make it seem as though it's a lot better. So uh, as a general rule, I will always uh, require my patients to provide at least one person who knows them well that can speak as to how they're doing. Because when I meet uh, Yossi and he tells me everything is going well, I'm doing fantastic in yeshiva, and his Rebbe tells me, I haven't seen Yossi at morning Seder in a month, uh, because he's always sleeping and he's crying in his bed, uh, that's very important clinical information. And when I uh, meet Mrs. Silver and she tells me everything is okay, you know, I just haven't been sleeping so well. And her husband says she sleeps about two hours a night and is up uh, every single evening doing sponge and cleaning all the closets out. I think maybe she has OCD. That's the very important clinical information that allows me to make the diagnosis. So it's so important uh, for everybody on this call to really take away that uh, unless you're providing information to the mental health practitioner, it's impossible for them to know what's going on in the home. And on that note, there are issues of confidentiality, uh, certainly, but uh, there's what's called a one-way valve meaning that as a uh, licensed provider, I can't uh, give any clinical information to uh, certain family members and people in the community, but I can always receive the information. Uh, so even if uh, you're concerned uh, about uh, confidentiality issues, uh, mental health by definition is potentially a crisis and you can save lives uh, by providing important information as a family member or a loved one. Okay, Dr. Freeman, I'll ask another question that somebody sent in as well. I'm currently in therapy for two years. I have seen five therapists and two psychiatrists. I am depressed and anxious 18-year-old girl. I have given up on everything getting I have given up on getting better recently. 
Is there anything you could share with me to help me have hope again? Uh, yeah, I think that being 18 is a really tough age to be. And I think that it sounds like obviously you've been through a lot of challenges if you've seen a lot of professionals, but uh, things are getting better and things are looking up and you're going to have a lot more autonomy as you move forward to uh, choose what you're looking for in life. And there are a lot of great possibilities out there uh, of different things that you can choose to do with your life moving forwards. So as an adolescent, it's hard uh, to move forward because oftentimes we feel that we're constrained by various things. But as an adult, uh, the MS is you'll have the uh, personal agency uh, to make any decisions that you feel like making. And you'll also, uh, the achrayas will be on you where you go from here. So that's a pretty exciting thing uh, in that you'll have the ability to choose your own destiny uh, moving forwards. What would you tell them if it's hard for, her, for them to hear the answer? Uh, while, you know, they're, while they're in the black, in the darkness, it's hard for him. And he, uh, uh, Again, this is a challenging question, obviously, because I don't have all of the information. But I think uh, for, for folks uh, who are transitioning into adulthood, uh, it can be obviously very scary. And I can only imagine that this person has been through some very difficult things over the course of their lives. Uh, but uh, there's always something positive in our life, even if it's... Uh, just the new ice cream flavor of the month, not to minimize suffering, but there's always something to look forward to. And there's always a new day. Uh, you know, we're going to have the sun coming up here where I'm at in about 45 minutes, even though it's the darkest time of the night right now. So there's always something to look forward to. And we kind of have to attach ourselves to that and just go day by day at some time. Uh, Okay. At what point does a child with behavioral issues become a child who requires help or therapy? Great question. So uh, in general, mental health issues uh, aren't found in just one setting. And I think this is a very important thing uh, to keep in mind. Uh, when I meet a young man who comes into my office and tells me I have terrible ADHD, I can't study at all uh, in, during morning Seder. But uh, in the afternoon, he has a fantastic job uh, trading foreign currencies uh, after learning it from his uncle. And he's doing wonderfully there. He's reading all sorts of books. Uh, it becomes clear to me that he has a problem focusing in morning Seder uh, because a true mental health issue goes across all settings. A, young child who is a terror at home, but is fantastic at school and sits beautifully in shul and does uh, wonderfully at the park, has a problem with his home. Uh, a child who does fantastic at home, wonderful at trumpet lessons and is uh, an absolute nightmare at school, has a school problem. So uh, in general, we can tell that it's a mental health challenge when it occurs uh, across multiple settings. And uh, specifically, that's why it's important for the parents and the teachers and other people involved uh, to get together and to see if there are themes across the different settings. Um, in general, uh, I also encourage people, go see a therapist, uh, go see a psychiatrist, because uh, you can always go and hear everything's okay. And that's like one of the best things that can happen is to go see a psychiatrist and be told, keep up the good work. You're doing fantastic. This is not a psychiatric problem. Uh, you've wasted a bit of time, sure. But hey, reassurance is fantastic. Uh, so in general, I would say if you have a concern that you need to go to see uh, a professional, go to see a professional. And uh, hopefully they'll tell you that everything's okay. But uh, Mamish, to answer uh, the question again one more time, a problem uh, in the mental health realm uh, goes across multiple settings. And that's really how we can tell uh, that it is a mental health challenge. Okay, let's take, uh, let's take some live questions now. 
Um, Shana, you're on. Hi. Um, thank you for taking my question. Um, so people have always said that in order to get closer to God and that you're supposed to meditate. And one of the problems I have is I'm afraid thoroughly to, to sit down and, and meditate because I've repressed and stored away all the different things from the last, you know, 20, 30 years. Um, and I'm really afraid that if I sit down and meditate that all these things are going to come to the surface and it's going to overwhelm me and I'm just going to like lose it. So how. Okay. I think the question just cut out. So uh, I'll uh, first off start by saying that uh, I'm meditating so hard right now that I am seeing a cat with green eyes uh, as opposed to a human being. So we can always, uh, you know, drift into a deep uh, spiritual place where all sorts of interesting things will happen. Uh, I'll put in a plug for a fantastic book that just came out uh, by Rabbi Feiner's brother called A Jewish Approach to Mindfulness. Um, I think that uh, different times uh, people will have uh, preconceptions, just like we have preconceptions of what a psychiatrist is, what an avrech is, uh, what a bacher in yeshiva is. Uh, we can also have uh, preconceptions of what is mindfulness, what is meditation. And we picture somebody who's sitting and going like this. Uh, but that's really not what uh, the goal of meditation is, is to you know, uh, wrap your head in uh, one of those white sheets and sit outside quietly uh, for days at a time. I think that the goal of uh, mindfulness and meditation is to be aware of one's internal state and to uh, just accept uh, the things that we are experiencing. And uh, the book goes through uh, the fact that there are Torah sources uh, that help us to relax and that can teach us to relax. And it's so important because the more that we are able to just be aware and to accept uh, our internal, emotional, psychological, uh, physiological, and spiritual state, the more we can be aware of how uh, feelings of frustration, uh, sadness, anger, uh, are directing our behaviors and maybe making us behave in ways that we uh, are unhappy with and, or maybe ways that we don't want to uh, interact with other people in our lives. So if we can be aware of our frustrations, uh, we can then go ahead and act uh, accordingly in, in order to make sure that we're being the loving, present, and caring uh, family members that we want to be. Um, so again, I, I don't know that you have to meditate and go so deeply into prior uh, challenges. I think just even uh, five minutes a day, I'll try to teach many of my patients to just be aware of their internal state uh, and to learn some of these mindfulness techniques. Um, the book is also uh, easy to read and has a picture of a ladybug on it, uh, if you want to identify it on Amazon. Would they benefit from sitting? <laughs> with somebody else at first so that they can have a holding hand to guide them. Brilliant uh, point, uh, Coach Menachem. I think that uh, certainly, you know, uh, if we try to learn uh, meditation from YouTube, there are some good things out there and some not so good things out there, but sitting with a trained professional who's able to teach us some of these skills is, is a great way to do it. And I tell folks, it's kind of like going to a personal trainer or to a dietitian. You know, uh, we all think that we know how to eat healthy, but going to see a nutritionist or a dietitian is a great way to really solidify uh, what it consists of in a lemaisidic way. Uh, we think that we know how to exercise, but seeing a personal trainer is a great way to uh, come up with a productive exercise regimen. Um, and learning mindfulness from somebody who's trained in this and uh, can teach you uh, these skills is absolutely a great way to make it happen. So uh, that's a plug for whoever is a fantastic mindfulness teacher out there in the community. Is that you, Coach Menachem? Sometimes. 
Great. So that's a plug for Coach Menachem. Thank you. There's a question here that so many children and adults are given labels relating to mental health. Some are correct, but many are misdiagnosed. How is it one able to know who is best equipped, which uh, therapist, um, how do you know where to go? Therapist, psychiatrist, where do they go first? Great question. Uh, I, I think, again, there's so many labels out there uh, of people who are diagnosed and misdiagnosed. Uh, the most important thing to remember is that uh, we're all human beings. And I'll oftentimes sit with uh, Mati Levy's uh, parents and say, Mr. and Mrs. Levy, uh, your son isn't the kid with OCD. He's Mati Levy, he's your son. And he happens to be struggling with OCD at the moment. But that doesn't mean that he's a psych patient. That doesn't mean that he is a raving lunatic. That doesn't mean that he is an OCD uh, or a statistic. It's, he's still Mati Levy. He's still that same kid. He's just struggling with this particular issue. And Zeras Hashem will get him through it. So uh, as far as labels are concerned, you know, labels can be uh, quite hurtful and quite frustrating. And we have to keep in mind that uh, a person who seeks help for a mental health issue is not their diagnosis. Uh, they are uh, that neshama uh, that we know and love. As far as uh, where's the right place to go, um, I know that you had my dear colleague, Reb Svi Gluck, uh, on uh, the call a couple of months ago. And uh, there are a lot of good organizations out there that will hear the situation and uh, under Torah guidance will find uh, a good place for a person to go. Uh, Amudi, the, 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 the <laughs> area is uh, relief and actually coming on one week from the Rebbe Rabad and Sandy Warnstein, I'm familiar with them. F fantastic, yeah, obviously relief is a great organization. Uh, they have a great network of providers uh, and sometimes can get people discounted care, which is fantastic. Um, in Eretz Yisrael, there's my friend, uh, Reb Shlomo Katz, who uh, has been running Relief, which has been rejuvenated here in Eretz Yisrael over the past half year or so. So uh, there are these organizations that will hear the story in a confidential manner and will help to provide a referral to a trained professional that can assess the situation. Uh, these are all free services, so I think the community should be aware of them and should not be concerned to call them and uh, ask for help as far as finding the appropriate place to uh, assess uh, and uh, treat any situation that might come up. Okay, Dr. Freeman, we have some live ones. Let's try to knock some out over here. Okay, you're on. Hi, okay, first of all, I must thank you for your columns in the Mishpacha. I enjoy them so much. I'm like the type of person that flips to the back and reads it back to front because I find that the end content is the most interesting. And I'm always disappointed when yeah, you're not kichels. here. Well, yes, I start with the kichels and then I work my way to your your articles and I, I I keep a copy of your book very accessible I really appreciate it um, my question is this I have somebody in my life that uh, is very a very big part of my life we're very close to and I think that she could benefit very greatly from going for for help um, I think she's she's been through so many trials and um, she's it's a little difficult because I broached the subject lightly and she she completely went off on me. She told me this is normal, this is called venting, and I see her cutting off relationships with people and I'm, I'm very concerned for her, for her whole family, and um, I don't know how to encourage her. I find that I'm a stabilizing force in her life, so I'm hesitant to encourage her to go for help when I know that she really needs it. What would you recommend would be the best way to get her to uh, be cognizant of the fact that she could really benefit and her life could really benefit from, from going for help. So that's a, a fantastic question. And uh, I think that we can use this as an introduction to the idea of what's called motivational interviewing. So motivational interviewing is an idea that uh, it doesn't matter what the patient's uh, problems are, according to me as the therapist, to you as the family member, friend, or mentor, or loved one. It matters what the patient's motivations are uh, to change themselves. So uh, I always think about uh, a 
56 year old alcoholic patient that I met during my training. And this fellow had drank so much that he was waiting to get a liver transplant. And I told him, Mr. O'Leary, you need a liver transplant. You have a drinking problem. And he said, that's okay because Mickey Mantle got a liver transplant and he survived. And I said, Mr. O'Leary, you have a drinking problem. Uh, your wife is going to divorce you. And he said, it's okay. I'll find a third wife. And I said, Mr. O'Leary, you have a drinking problem. You got a DUI and they took away your license because you were driving while you were intoxicated. And he says, it's okay. I can take the bus. And I said, Mr. O'Leary, you have a drinking problem. Uh, you are facing counts of disorderly conduct and you're going to go to jail. He said, I've been to jail. It's not a big deal. And I have a great lawyer. This public defender is fantastic. And I said, Mr. O'Leary, your dog ran away uh, when you were drunk the other night. You have a drinking problem. And he says, my dog ran away. Oh, doc, this is terrible. You know, how did you know that? How am I going to find my dog? And uh, the truth was, you know, his sponsor had came in uh, from AA uh, to talk to the team and had said, listen, the guy's dog ran away. I found it. And, you know, that's uh, maybe the thing that's going to push him to get help. Now, again, for me, I would say going to jail and getting a liver transplant, the surgery uh, due to the amount of alcohol this fellow was drinking would be a much bigger reason to change. But for him, it was his dog. Uh, apparently it was a really cool dog. So uh, all we can say is that uh, we have to help a person find their motivation for change. And once we find their motivation for change, we really try to run with that and to uh, inspire them to know that uh, whatever you're looking for that could be better in your life, the, the truth is you can make that happen if you put your mind to it and you have the right support. <laughs> So I hope that that answers your question. Dr. Freeman, let's jump on this question over here. My husband lost his job and he has a hard time getting out of bed in the morning. How do I know if it's just because he has he's in a bad mood or he's suffering from real depression? That is a fantastic question. Uh, again, what is normal stress and a normal response to a stressful situation and what is a mental health issue? So uh, in general, uh, we realize that people who are going through stressful situations are at a greater risk of developing an issue with mental health. There's what's called the two-hit hypothesis, which is that there's a genetic predisposition, a genetic risk, and then there's an environmental stressor uh, that uh, pushes that uh, person over the edge to the point where they're now suffering from uh, a mental health issue. And I, I think that uh, we can all agree that uh, life is stressful and it's very difficult out there, but sometimes uh, people will end up uh, being in a place where they're no longer engaged whatsoever. So for depression, uh, we're thinking about the physical symptoms of depression specifically. So uh, again, not getting out of bed, a lack of energy, uh, not eating, um, not being able to focus on anything. Also, you know, the husband who's struggling and sleeping in because he doesn't have what to wake up for, but in the afternoon is going to the gym and picking up the kids from Cheder and learning uh, his normal night Seder Chabrusa seems as though he's just struggling in the morning because he's lost his daily schedule. But uh, the husband who's in bed literally all day and has a fixed uh, depressed mood, meaning uh, nothing is funny, nothing is exciting, nothing is worth getting up for. Uh, those could be the signs and symptoms uh, of depression, that things are a bit worse than we were hoping they might be. Okay, let's go to another question now. Hello, Hello, Reverend. You're muted. Hello? Mute and unmute again. Try again. Mute him. I'm going to ask him mute. Try again. Unmute. Hello? 
So I'm back out and comment because your mic's not working. I want to go back to the question that we discussed before about talking to a close relative and she doesn't want to hear about it. And you were, you were saying the good example of just finding the, that one thing, it might be the dog, but it sometimes can be very scary. The relative might stop talking to you. They might blow up. You feel like, who knows, they're not going to want to have any relationships anymore. But that's you know what I mentioned before in the beginning, that it might be the way how to get them to help because they're coming to you to vent. And afterwards they feel good. So why should they go to help if they have you? Okay, that's a great point. We don't want to serve as a crutch for somebody and to enable them to continue. You know, uh, you're talking to your uh, cousin Joey and cousin Joey thinks that uh, because you're there schmoozing with him, you know, I got this cousin who's a therapist. I have this aunt who's a rabbit's in. I have this... Uh, neighbor who's a big mensch and a big bucky by uh, helping the seaboard. So uh, I don't really need to go to talk to a professional. I think that that's where we all have to know our limits. You know, even in my personal life, uh, I make it very clear to my neighbors that I'm happy to schmooze with them, but that I'm never going to be their therapist. I'm never going to be their psychiatrist. And I really encourage them uh, when folks come to talk to me, I validate their concerns. I tell them, listen, it sounds like you're going through quite a time. This is a great reason to see a psychiatrist. But Dr. Friedman, you're a psychiatrist. You know, can't you just schmooze with me? I say I can, uh, but uh, that's not really what I'm here for. Because again, I live in your neighborhood. I don't think that you want me to know all of the things that you're going through uh, in such detail, because I don't want you to be embarrassed seeing me when we're walking a shoal. And uh, the other thing is, uh, I think that this deserves the time and the focus of a professional. So even for our family members, you know, we can tell them, listen, you know, I I'm always going to be your brother. You can't fire me from being your brother. But, uh, you know, this is something that really needs professional help. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go with you to your first appointment. So you don't need to be uh, scared. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to talk with Relief. I'm going to talk with Amudim, with Ezra Metzion, Chaim Bechesed, any of these organizations. And I'm going to set up the appointment for you and I'll drive you out there and I'll hang out with you. And afterwards, I'll take you out for an ice cream. But uh, I am not there to be your therapist because... And and the, the spouse says, I don't need to go for help. I don't yeah. know why you're encouraging, encouraging me to go for help. I don't need to. They're yeah. refusing. So, uh, again, that's where we try and find the motivation for change. You know, whether mm -hmm. it's, listen, you might not feel you need to go for help, but, uh, you know, I see that our relationship is suffering uh, because you're struggling with depression. Or I know how hard it is for the kids to wake up in the morning and say, you know, uh, Ima, why do I have to go to school if Tati doesn't have to go to, uh, to work? You know, or for... You know, your Chabrusa called and says that he misses you and people are wondering what's going on and wondering when you're going to get back to your game. So whatever that motivation might be, uh, I think that we have to find it, really hone in on it. And then uh, as part of motivational interviewing, we try to get people to uh, commit to SMART goals. So SMART meaning uh, Roche Tebos. We're all from guys here, so we like Roche Tebos. SMART is uh, specific, uh, measurable, achievable, uh, realistic, and timely. In that uh, we try to get people to commit just to a small thing that they can actually uh, make happen that's gonna happen uh, immediately. So listen, I'm not telling you uh, uh, to go ahead and to commit to a lifetime of therapy. I'm telling you just make the appointment today. You know, it's specific call up and book the appointment, it's measurable. It either happened or it didn't. It's achievable, meaning that anybody can make a phone call. It's realistic because obviously the person could go ahead and uh, make that happen and it's timely. Today, make the phone call to book that appointment. Uh, you know, today, I'm not telling you go to 90 meetings in 90 days for a substance abuse issue. I'm just telling you, commit to going today to an AA group, uh, an Alcoholics Anonymous 12 strap meeting. So uh, that sometimes makes it less daunting. You know, I'm not telling you to never drink again. I'm just telling you don't drink tomorrow and go to an AA meeting. Uh, 
Um, so I think that that's perhaps a way that we can make it happen. Thank you so much, guys. Amazing answer. Let's try to see if Rabbi Rum is on Rabbi Rum. Say hello, see if it works. Still not working. Okay, let's go to the next one. Try again. Mike is Mike. I can't hear. I can't hear. Let's go to the next one. To the other one. Just one second. Dr. Freeman is another person coming on. Sure. Hey, yes, you're on. Hi, Dr. Friedman. Howdy. How are you? So, oh, okay. I've, yeah. okay, ben. so I've been struggling with, 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 with major depression and it feels like it's becoming too severe at this point. I feel like I don't want to get up in the morning. It feels like it's progressive. Like it just every day gets a little worse. I don't know why it's like this and I'm taking a medicine for it. And nothing is working. I live alone, and I'm wondering is this, is this, is this a situation? What, what, to, what? I don't know what to do about it. Okay, thank, thanks so much for asking that question. Um, I have to give a, a medical legal disclaimer that uh, anything that I say right now uh, is not meant as specific advice for you, but rather uh, some thoughts for a person in a similar situation. And it's not because I, I don't hope things work out for you, uh, AS, uh, but rather that uh, it's not really fair to me to make a sock without knowing all the details. But forget about me. For you, without knowing your whole story, I could give you terrible advice. So uh, I hope that uh, we can just think about a few quick thoughts that might be helpful. Number one is that uh, sometimes treatment takes a long time to work. Um, I always tell folks that uh, if we go out to the Grand Canyon and we decide to take a selfie uh, at the edge of the Grand Canyon and obviously try not to fall in, uh, that that's pretty easy. You know, you walk from the parking lot out to the edge of the Grand Canyon, you take a picture and then you walk 15 minutes back to the parking lot. But if you decide to go for a deep hike all the way in, you got to walk down about uh, six, seven, 10 hours, and then you have to schlep all the way back up. And schlepping back up is a lot harder than uh, going down. So in general, for uh, each week, each month that a person has been suffering, it can take a week or a month to get better. Uh, that's both because uh, therapy and medications don't really work immediately. Um, and I, I think that that can be a big challenge for some people because they say, listen, I've been in therapy for a month. I started taking a medication, you know, six weeks ago, and I still feel pretty terrible. And the answer is, well, you know, you've been struggling for months before you came in. And uh, this is going to be a big challenge because, you know, you've gone down so far that it's going to take a while to come back up. So we have to have really realistic expectations as far as that's concerned. And from my perspective, I think that that also brings up the issue of getting timely care and not being afraid to uh, go for an evaluation or to reach out for help. Because the longer uh, that we wait and the more uh, suffering that uh, comes to a person in the process, the harder it is to rebuild their life. Not that it's not worthwhile, has but uh, that it's so important to keep in mind that Sometimes it takes a while. You know, we say, uh, uh, if you go outside and you look for uh, the seeds growing in your backyard, uh, it can take a long time to watch seeds sprout. But you know, when you come back in a week and check on it, uh, you'll see those uh, string beans growing up in your garden. So I, I wish you the best of health. And, and I would just tell you, keep on trying, stay positive, you know, do good things like, you know, make sure that you have a nine to five schedule, even if it's not a job, volunteering is a fantastic thing to do. Uh, cardiovascular exercise, daily mindfulness and relaxation. And, you know, living alone can also be a big challenge, making sure that, you know, you're with loved ones or just good people specifically on Shabbos and the high game is so important. Okay, let's go to the next slide one. I think it's working now. <coughs> Hello. Hi, it's working. Oh, Mazel Tov. Mazel tov. Thank you very much. How are you, Dr. Friedman? Thank you for taking my call. 
Um, I have a twofold question, and perhaps you addressed it already, but uh, I tuned in the middle, so I'm not sure, and I apologize for if you have to repeat yourself. The twofold question is as follows. Mental health issue. Is it a thing that somebody is really born with and just doesn't surface until later on for whatever reason why what triggered the surfacing? Or is it something which a person could be not born with any issue whatsoever and it can develop totally from scratch later on in a person's life due to whatever stresses or whatever it is? That's one question. And my second question is, regardless of, of when the development happens, whether it's from you're born with it or not, why, I'm trying to understand the lumbus of it. Why does it affect religious beliefs? Like, you know, a non-Jew in, you know, in, the, in the world, in the Gaisha world, I'm sure the same, there's the same, symptom, the same mental health issues. I mean, there's no beliefs over there to affect, but why does it, why is it the first and foremost thing that it affects religious beliefs? Like what, what, why is it related to that? Sure. I mean, whatever, okay, that, that's in a nutshell. Those are Hazonish level questions, uh, Rob Korelitz. Uh, wow. So thank you so much for asking them. Uh, again, just to summarize, the first question was, uh, why is it that there are some people uh, who are more likely to develop mental health issues uh, under certain stressors? And why is it that other people can deal with tremendous amount of stress uh, without developing mental health challenges? And again, I think one of the things that I had said was there's what's called the two hit hypothesis, meaning there's a genetic uh, risk and then there's the environmental stress. Now. If you put people under enough stress, uh, essentially most people will eventually break down. And uh, whether that stress is you know, financial stress, uh, stress at work, uh, stress with the family, uh, or physiological stress, things like not sleeping enough. Um, I, I had a lot of colleagues during my training uh, when we were working you know, up to 100, 110 hours a week in the hospital, who kind of broke down under the stress and needed vacations, uh, it can be very challenging not to sleep enough. Uh, it can also be uh, very challenging when a person is using drugs and alcohol. Um, you know, marijuana uh, for a person that has uh, the underlying genetic risk factors for bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, anxiety, and depression, uh, that can really uh, destroy a person's uh, brain chemistry. Uh, alcohol for a person who has had serious trauma uh, or who uh, has genetic risk factors for anxiety and depression can really push a person over the edge. So there's uh, resilience, which is a uh, both works on a genetic and uh, environmental level, meaning we can uh, have our own ability to cope with things that we're born with, but we can also develop the skills to be better at coping with stress. And we can do that through things like mindfulness relaxation practice that Coach Menachem teaches, uh, or we can go ahead and learn it from cardiovascular exercise, from eating healthy, from making sure that we're engaged uh, with good people in our lives and have a good support network. So we can work on resilience to deal with environmental stress. Um, Rav Gorelis, your next question was about why is it that uh, people in the Frum Belt have symptoms that have to do with uh, Yiddishkeit, with halacha, with hashkafa? And the truth is, is Baruch Hashem, that's what we do, is we live halacha, we love halacha, and we uh, are yearning for Mashiach. You know, uh, when a young bacher becomes manic or psychotic, uh, it's very common that uh, he'll be talking about Mashiach, he'll be talking about Kabbalah, uh, the safer in my office that uh, most people grab off the shelf when they come in is Shari Gilgulim, because they're excited to tell me about how they're a Gilgul of Shmuel and Avi, or Honi Amagel, or whoever it might be. So uh, this is what we're living and doing. 
you know, when I was in Boston at a large academic hospital during my training, uh, there were a lot of uh, young men and women from the Haitian community that would come into the hospital. And they'd always come in uh, when they were psychotic, telling me about how their neighbor was voodooing them or how people were placing curses on them. And uh, that was what uh, they experienced culturally. Um, I've had uh, patients, uh, Arab patients from the Middle East, uh, who have told me that there are genies whispering in their ears because that's culturally how they experience uh, auditory hallucinations. So uh, a patient with OCD in our community could be very likely to be uh, misdiagnosed as somebody who started uh, to be into humrus and halachas. Um, but uh, what they're doing uh, is really a symptom of uh, obsessive thinking and compulsive checking by asking uh, repetitive shilas about things that they might already know the answers to. So everything is always viewed through a cultural lens uh, is how I would answer that second question, Rep. Rally. What? Uh, okay, uh, Dr. Yeah. let me ask you this question. Let's do the live one first. Let's do one live one, and then I'll do one more question, and then we'll go to closing, because I know you have to finish at 11.15. Okay? Perfect. Okay, you're on it. <coughs> SS, you want to unmute? Okay, I'll read this question. I'm currently mar married to a certified BPD, borderline personality disorder wife. We have gone for years for therapy, many different therapists and tried many different types of therapies. Nothing seems to really help. My question is as follows. I feel like my only option is to really get divorced at this point, but seeing from my other friends how difficult divorcing such a person is, is it worth to get divorced or is, it, is there still hope for somebody with borderline personality disorder to get help? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, that's hard for me to answer because I'm not going to give a pasak on uh, somebody divorcing their wife or their husband on a Zoom call uh, at five in the morning my time. Um, in general, also, that's not up for uh, me to decide. Uh, that's up for the individual themselves uh, to make a decision on. And as with any decision, there's always milas and chesronas. Um, we have to not only think about what is the pro and the con of doing something, but we have to think about what is the pro of not doing something and what is the con of not doing something. So uh, divorce can be a tremendous challenge uh, for the family, for the children, for the husband, for the wife, for everybody who's involved. And in general, I really only encourage uh, my patients to separate if there's uh, issues of domestic abuse, domestic violence, because that's where it's so important for the mental health clinician uh, to uh, encourage safety as the number one priority. I think that if there is significant abuse going on, it's important to make an intervention to protect uh, the children, uh, to protect uh, whichever spouse there might be. Uh, but uh, again, without knowing all the details, that's a hard uh, thing for me to paskin on. I will say that uh, Baruch Hashem, there are a lot of great professionals out there. Um, in Eretz role, my dear friend, Dr. Shmuel Harris uh, is a fantastic expert in borderline personality disorder and complex trauma, and he's a firm guy. So, you know, there's a lot of uh, great resources out there for the firm community uh, to deal with these challenges as with every challenge. Um, I think, again, I, I try to tell people to avoid making final decisions, even though uh, unless you're a Kohen, you can always hazard your Garusha. Um, this is, uh, you know, divorce is oftentimes final and uh, most likely it is final. So I generally encourage people to slow things down, uh, and not to make those kind of decisions until they've exhausted all of their options. I just want to, we have a general question over here and specifically for our culture. 
how do we know if it's mental illness or it's maybe the Yate Sahara? All of these things that you don't want to do and you're not in the mood or different things. Great question. Um, so the Yate Sahara is never going to tell anybody to kill themselves. Uh, that's just not a language that he speaks. Uh, the Yate Sahara is never going to tell anybody to do drugs. Uh, again, that's not a language that he speaks. To have a good time. Yeah, uh, that's true. Like I, I, I hear what you're saying, but, um, you know, I, I think in general, um, this is why it's so important uh, for uh, Rabbanim, uh, for Rebetzins, for community leaders, uh, for the Rebbeim at Yeshiva to know uh, about the science and the symptoms of mental illness. Um, I've seen so many young uh, men and women who have been struggling for uh, mamish forever, and uh, nobody was able to realize that they were dealing with uh, depression, with uh, OCD, with anxiety, and sometimes with more serious mental illness, uh, like uh, psychosis or bipolar disorder. It's always very sad for me to hear about somebody who went to go see a Makubal uh, and the advice that they got was to say certain uh, pasukim uh, when really they needed to go see a professional. And uh, because they waited, they ended up in the hospital, sometimes uh, even worse. I, I go around and I do these talks. Again, uh, I don't normally wake up at, at four o'clock in the morning uh, to uh, hang out on Zoom with uh, people that I don't know. Uh, the reason that I'm doing this is because mental health is uh, Sakanas Nefashos. Um, I used to give talks uh, to the medical students and at different medical schools, uh, but uh, I didn't really start talking in the community until about five years ago when I got a phone call in the middle of the night from a Rosh Yeshiva that I knew well, who told me that one of his students had uh, jumped off of the dorm and was uh, nifter. And uh, I went in, I spoke with the Rosh Hashiva, I spoke with the staff, I spoke with the Bacharim, because uh, there were about 300 people who witnessed this uh, when all was said and done. And the more that I heard about it, uh, this specific situation, uh, the more it was clear to me that this was a patient actually who hadn't committed suicide on purpose. He, he had bipolar disorder and he thought he could fly based on his journal. And this was a fellow who had clearly had signs and symptoms of uh, severe mental illness for weeks. Uh, he had been up at two in the morning screaming at the Aron Kodesh. He had been yelling to Hillam all day long. He had been saying all sorts of uh, really out of control and scary things. But people thought that he was just the Baal Tshuva. And that was so sad for me because this was very much a preventable tragedy. And not just for this young uh, man, this neshama, for his family, but really for everybody else that saw it, that knew him, this was a preventable tragedy. So after uh, that experience, I basically went around and became kind of a rogue public health advocate in that whoever was willing to listen to me, I was happy to talk with uh, as far as uh, organizations, yeshivas, seminaries, high schools, whatever it might be, because again, uh, you can't have a solution unless you have a problem and you don't have a problem unless you're talking about it. And education is so important to remove the stigma of uh, mental health and substance use in order to make sure that people get the help that they need in a timely fashion so these challenges don't happen. And I remember that I was brought to a yeshiva to talk uh, with the Rosh Yeshiva about teaching his staff about signs and symptoms of uh, mental illness in the Bacharim to ensure that tragedies like this wouldn't happen again. And the Rosh Yeshiva told me, uh, Bar Hashem, we're a good Yeshiva. We don't have those kids here. And I said uh, to the Rosh Yeshiva, as I looked across the base Midrash and recognized three or four of my patients, I said, uh, Bar Hashem, the Rosh Yeshiva has lots of good Talmudim here. It just so happens that some of them uh, must have challenges with uh, mental health because good people have challenges with mental health too. Um, and he said, no, 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 we don't have kids like that at uh, the Yeshiva. And I said, Kavod Rosh Yeshiva, I see many of my patients sitting here staggering away. And if we don't talk about this, uh, there could be a tragedy. Um, so 
uh, in the end, uh, whether or not he was willing to listen, that's his story, uh, not our story for tonight. But uh, I think that we really have an achrayas, and I appreciate everybody uh, being here because by definition, being on this call suggests that uh, you've taken a personal achrayas to uh, support uh, people in our community who have challenges with mental health issues. And uh, nobody feels alone, like the patient with depression. Uh, we know that that's a core symptom, but beyond that, nobody feels alone like the spouse, like the child, or like the parent of somebody who is experiencing a mental health challenge. Uh, when there's a, a child who's in the hospital getting chemotherapy, the entire community is baking kugels and saying to heal him. But when there's a young man or woman who's in rehab or who's in a psych hospital, uh, the stigma is so profound that uh, the community oftentimes won't reach out to that family. And I would just urge everybody, do it in a kind way, do it in a respectful manner, but do not be afraid to reach out to your neighbor, to your chavrusa, to your friend, your family member, and just say, listen, I know that there's some difficult things happening by you, and I just want to let you know that if there's anything I can do for you, that I'm here. And I would really urge everybody to do that. And again, to go back to our sponsor, Kanpe Fega, that's really what they're doing. And that's why I'm honored to be on the call uh, with you, Coach Manasseh. Okay, thank you. So let, let me just go to closing. I know if you want to speak again, I know you have to go. Um, again, to Dr. Freeman tonight. Okay, Suri, are you on? Yeah, okay. If you want to say something, because Dr. Freeman has to go. Yeah, Dr. Freeman, thank you. It's Mrs. Rosenfeld from Kampe Fega. The point you just made about um, one of the impetus for our organization is a woman who said she had a neighbor with a child with cancer and she would watch how the woman was getting meals and homework helpers for her kids and all the support that she needed. Her husband was uh, hospitalized for a psychiatric illness and she could have used all of those support and all of those services and there was, she was all alone because the nature of the illness is not something you're going to the bus stop at the corner and saying, hey, my husband's been in a psychiatric ward for the last week. I really need help. So um, that's one of the reasons we started Camp Fake. I would have loved to hear the question addressed that my, my volunteers and advocates struggle a lot with when dealing with these families is why is it that one day Mrs. Uh, I got Mrs. Stern, whatever it is, to make Shabbos beautifully. And then the next week, three o'clock in the afternoon, she's still in bed and she can't get her act together. A little bit of description of the nature of mental illness and how it has its ups and downs, but there is hope at the end of the tunnel. And we, you know, hopefully we raise, you know, they become, they go from 20% functional to 40% functional to 60% functional. And, you know, over the course of time, we, you see tremendous change. If you can make, you know, just comment on that. Uh, certainly. And, and again, a, a big yesher koch for all the amazing work that you're doing uh, with this great new organization. Um, I think that uh, mental health is a big challenge because you can look at somebody who uh, just had orthopedic surgery and their knee repaired and you can say, ah, that guy's on a crutch. Um, and you can tell that that fellow is going to have a tough time ambulating uh, without that crutch. But uh, in mental health, we can oftentimes look at people and say, you know, he looks normal. What's his problem? Or yesterday was a good day. Why is today such a challenge? Um, I think, again, it's hard to tell what are the stressors that will push a person over the edge. And uh, in mental health, it's so important to ensure uh, that uh, a person is getting enough sleep a person is medication compliant, that sobriety is maintained, and that stress is really minimized during that immediate recovery period from uh, acute episodes of uh, psychiatric illness. And that is something uh, that could potentially explain why one day somebody's doing okay and the next they're uh, erupting or melting down. And uh, we have to really keep that in mind that, uh, again, as you said, there is such a need to support folks, uh, specifically uh, when uh, folks are in the hospital or when uh, they've just gotten home uh, from a detox or from a hospitalization, because that's when people are at the greatest risk for uh, relapse. So we really need to make sure that uh, the family members have the support that they need. Uh, we need to make sure that uh, the patient themselves uh, is able to get enough rest and really participate in their uh, treatment plan. 
And as with everything, you know, Kaddish Baruch Hu is the boss and we got to dive in and uh, whether we want to say, you know, Tachshot Tov Yetov, uh, think positively or Trach Good Bezayin Good, you know, we have to hope that uh, if we stay positive, if we uh, dive in and we do our part, that Kaddish Baruch Hu will do his part and he'll bring us a true and lasting truth. Thank you, Dr. Freeman. If you have to hang up, you can go. If you want to stay, you can stay. I, I know you have to go. I really appreciate Tari for pushing you. I'm just going to run quickly through the closing, and Menachem will wrap up. What? And you could sign off, Dr. Freeman, if you have to go. Again, sure. thank you. I, I really Dr. appreciate uh, a grocery yesher cloth to you, Reb Usher, for uh, being a tremendous ringleader on this one, and Coach Menachem, obviously, for all the great work the two of you are doing. Uh, I'm letting you, Dr. Freeman. You, I'm not, I say this every time, but for you, it's really, really, you have to come back again. We, we barely touched. I mean, we got to do it when the seeking is like 10 o'clock in the afternoon. So then you can stay later. <laughs> or we could just start at like, you know, two in the morning, my time to see if we can get, uh, you know, all of the questions in. Okay. Um, like people want to know if they want to get in touch with you or anything, if there's any specific email, uh, there's email Coach Menachem. Uh, yeah, Coach Menachem is fine, but folks can also go through the website, uh, drjacobelfriedman.com, uh, Friedman with two E's, and you can just Google it, and it's the first thing that shows up, and you send a message, and it'll get to my secretary. Okay, thank you, Dr. Friedman, Everybody again, well. to Dr. Friedman for coming on tonight, giving us so much chizik, and really, a lot of people didn't even know what you looked like, by the way, just, what he's like, is he a svarity, is he this, but now we got to meet him, Baruch Hashem, a special thank you to Kanfei Fega for being the sponsor tonight, again, Kanfei Fega is being uh, sponsored, Eleil Mishwas, Reb Dachi, Reb Shloima, the mother of Fagel, who Kanfei again is named after the 97 year old Holocaust survivor, was nipped last week. Women or men who are suffering from mental illness or their spouse call called Kanfei Fega for intake appointments. Once they go through the interviews completed, the family will be asked to use help, and they, they basically Kanfei Fega will peer them up uh, with an advocate and it'll help them. Any man or woman on this call tonight, they really need volunteers to help out, you know, for about 40 minutes twice a week. Tremendous chesed, really help out. Um, again, the number to reach out to is 732. 506-2590. And if anybody here, them or their spouse is going through something and they need the help, they want them, not, not the neighbor. Don't call up my neighbor's going through something. You yourself, call up, be mature, take the first step in the positive direction, as you heard from tonight, and call them and tell them that you need help and that they really are here to help you. And uh, I think it's tremendous chesed. Uh, I, I mean, I'm blown away from the organization. Again, the number is 732-506-2590. Uh, again, another sponsor tonight is Grand Max. They're doing the PPP loans. If anybody needs specific help, they're there to help you and to guide you through it and do all the paperwork. Email them at info at grantmax.net or call them or text them at 609-300-3928. Next Sunday, we're going to have a powerful, powerful share with Rabbi Heshi Kleiman. I call him the master of prayer. He is the guy who knows everything about davening, every question. Um, it's going to be a very powerful event, and we're going to ask him everything that you ever thought about asking in davening. I already can think of 10 questions myself. It should be an amazing session. Um, again, anybody who knows the program, please send it around. Let people know that there's, every Sunday night we have a tremendous oilum here, and it's being, it will be mechazek each other. Literally, probably tonight, it was about 12, 1,300 people that came on in total. And uh, Dr. Freeman was, 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 was a pleasure. Even though he's not here, I'm letting him know that. Uh, everything is recorded. It's going to be on www.menachembernfeld.com. If anybody has any questions for Dr. Friedman, you can go to his website or you can email coachmenachem at gmail.com. The share is number th share 37. It's all pre-recorded and you can go on to um, the phone number that we have is 848-777-GROW. Again, a thank you to our advertising sponsors, like the Scoop, Hazak, Rabbi, and Yaniv. And a special thank you to Chayla Kaufman and Shul Summer from JCN. Coach Menachem. The floor is yours. Thank you. You did it again. Great job. So I want to thank Dr. Friedman for um, coming on tonight, giving us his time. And uh, again, we only got to touch a little bit and there's so much more questions that came in. It's just not possible to cover everything in an hour and 15 minutes. But uh, a little bit a little bit of a beginning of awareness and uh, Thank you very much for the sponsors, Kamfe Fega, and uh, Hashem should help them. They should have a tzlacha. We shouldn't need the program, but as long as we need them, they're there. I just want to end that the truth that I can't, I can't say I understand you, those people that go through mental illness. If I've never been there, I can't say that I understand you. And I can't imagine what you're going through. And when you need to take a break, it's okay to take a break. And when you finish taking that break and you continue and you try to find some hope, 
and you just don't give up. You go on and you never know, you never know what it is that will be there, that will be the thing that will give you the strength, the hope and the light at the end of the tunnel. And uh, I want to give a bracha, Hashem should help us all and all of those um, struggling with the challenges that they should find the light in the end of the tunnel in Hashem and on the way also some some positives that they can pick up in Amit Hashem they should be able to continue and Hashem should help us all thank you so much and I guess we'll see you next week Sunday night thank you very much Coach Menachem an amazing closing see everybody next week same time same place Sunday night 10 o'clock Rebbe Hesha the, the prayer of fire see you all next week thank you